Okay, welcome to uh, part three of three here. Um, we've talked about dispersal. Now we're going to talk about migration. Uh, migration, again, like we said before, is repeated movement back and forth. Okay, there's a long journey from winter habitat to summer habitat back to winter habitat, so on and so forth. Um, and because these are typically long journeys through places where there might not be a lot of food available, this can be pretty hard on the individual animals, right? It can really, by the time they get to their, their uh, new ground, they can be pretty worn out, and pretty hard up. Um, and so it's, it's a, a major concern for us in terms of when the animals arrive, can they recover from that? Because it's so hard and so hard on the animals, sometimes we get individuals that just simply don't. Right? We think about geese migrating, right? but not every goose migrates. Some of them stay in the winter habitat, some of them stay in the summer habitat. They just don't feel like putting up with it, so they don't do it. Right? And the problem with migration, different from problems with, with dispersal where it's tough to identify individuals and stuff like that, the problem with migration is that these distances are usually so long that they often cross state and or federal boundaries. Right. Uh, we've talked about monarch butterflies before. They will often cross, uh, they, well, they do. They cross the border between the United States and Mexico. And trying to manage across a federal border is nothing short of a nightmare. Where there were three stages to dispersal, there are four stages to migration. We have to add in an earlier stage because this is so difficult, so hard on the individual, and that is preparation. Okay. In the months and weeks leading up to the actual migration event, they are going to start hoarding food. They're going to start stockpiling calories in their body. Okay. Getting ready to have enough energy to go the long distance. Next stage is movement. Okay. Uh, where they go from point to point. Right. Now, this movement, because this is over such long distance, this is never a straight, straight shot. Right, you always got to stop off at the uh, at the toll plaza to get get some food and go to the bathroom. Right, so we've got frequent stopovers along the way, places where we can rest, where we can eat. Okay, depending on the distance of the migration, depending on the speed of travel, there might be few, there might be a lot of these, but they're always going to occur. And then eventually, the fourth and final stage here is arrival, where they get settled in. Right. Um, Males and or females pick out where they're going to be in the new spot. Um, they pair up and they start again with preparation, but here now preparation for reproduction rather than for the next part of the turtle. And then of course they do the whole thing going back the other direction again. Another form of behavior here that ties into the last chapter um, is anti-predator behavior. Um, it's kind of like the most important test you'll ever take. Right. If you choose the wrong answer, you die. Right. Um, and so animals have lots of different ways at which they try to choose the right answer. Um, they can be cryptic, right? Which is to say they they hide, they get camouflaged. So things like uh, this American bittern, which is a bird, right? Um, <clears throat> they can avoid capture by going immobile. If you've ever startled a deer. Uh, or you've ever startled a, particularly a young of year deer at a fawn, they stand still, right? They freeze up. And the idea there is that if they don't move, they're less likely to be seen. Okay, we talked about vision being important for mammalian predators in particular, uh, but also for birds. A lot of what they're looking for is movement. So if you don't move, you might not be seen. Uh, they also can use refuges, places where predators can't get to. So a lot of birds, for example, will nest on islands, which are hard for um, small rodents to get to when they would eat the eggs. Uh, what's called vigilance, right? Where one animal watches while the other animals eat or drink or whatever, and they take turns doing that. Uh, living in groups, okay? If you live with 15 of your best friends, right? It's like, uh, any of those uh, slasher movies, right? Uh, the, the killer only retakes out one person at a time, right? And in theory, at any point, all the other people could get up and they could leave the, sun, the, the abandoned summer camp and be safe, 
They should, they don't, and so they all die. But this is what living in groups is about. So things that flock, they flock because a predator can only take one animal at a time. And it's, if there's a whole bunch of you, the odds of it being you is pretty slim. And then sometimes we get things like group defense, where it's not just a passive group activity, um, but if a predator is found, all of the individuals in the group will come, come attack the predator. Um, so if you ever seen mobbing behavior by crows, this is that kind of a kind of a thing. Now, the reason this becomes important is a, a couple of different direct impacts of, of predation on prey populations, right? Obviously, there's the direct demographic impact. You lose somebody if they get eaten, okay? Um, <clears throat> but there are also indirect effects, right? When we talk about these behaviors, some of these behaviors lead to doing things like avoiding certain areas, right? Or avoiding them at certain times, okay? And this can be pretty important, right? In terms of understanding management ideas and management implications. So again, we keep coming back to uh, the reintroduction of wolves in Yellowstone, right? For a hundred years, there were no wolves. And so the, the prey items that were there just kind of did whatever they wanted to do, right? But now that there's wolves again, we're starting to see different um, patterns of habitat use, different patterns of activity in terms of, of timing of use of things and stuff like that. Obviously the opposite would be true also, right? So when we removed all the wolves from Yellowstone, that loss of those predators also changed habitat use and activity patterns, right? Um, <clears throat> and one of the dangers with, um, with doing that, uh, doing any of those kinds of big predator changes is that you start to ingrain behaviors. Um, and one of the things we're seeing in Yellowstone right now is that because they were without predation for so long, um, it's been a hard lesson for a lot of those deer and uh, other prey items because they're not afraid of predators, right? It's like the, the dodo, right? Um, when the uh, uh, British sailors landed on, uh, there's a Sandwich Islands, and they wiped out the dodo, they did so because the dodo didn't fear them. They weren't afraid of them. They would walk right up to them. And so the sailors could just club them and eat them. Um, and eventually they, they wiped them all out, right? And so one of the concerns we have with um, reintroducing predators after a period of, of no predators being present is that loss of concern and potentially devastating effects on the prey populations. One thing um, that's kind of, it's a little bit outside the scope of our, of our course, but it's interesting really nonetheless, and it's certainly worthwhile talking about. Um, is grouping, is, is social systems, right? Why do animals do this? Uh, as it turns out, most animals live in groups at least a little while. They might spend most of the time solitary, but they, they come together to do, uh, to do different things. Usually reproduction, but occasionally other things. Um, and this can be, you know, flocks, herds, packs, bands, aggregations, murders if they're crows, you know, whatever. Um, And if you live in a group versus living as a solitary individual, it has a pretty big impact on, on habitat use, right? Um, in the sense that if you are group living, wherever you are, you're always in competition with other members of your group. So that can be a little bit difficult. For most social groups, okay, so herds and things like that, um, they live in the same space, but they don't have any social hierarchy, right? They're, they're together with other individuals, but they're, they're not concerned with other individuals. So deer, raccoons, squirrel, uh, game birds like quail and turkey, they might live with 20 or 30 other individuals, but they're just out for themselves during that time, okay? There are some groups that we call communal, where they share space, but also duty, right? So prairie dogs, wolves, Harris's hawks, these animals um, do things like they share care of offspring, they share vigilance activities, um, that sort of stuff where they, again, there's kind of a trade-off. And, and typically with these communal groups, there's genetic 
um, linkages between them. There's some kind of familial relationship between them. Eusociality, um, which is something we see in bees, and wasps, and ants, uh, where there's like a worker class and a reproductive class. We don't know it really in vertebrates. We only ever see it in one thing, uh, the naked mole rat. And even then, it's a little bit questionable. Why they do all this stuff, though, again, it comes to the cost-benefit relationships, right? Um, survival and reproduction both tend to get easier if there's more individuals, okay? Um, for a variety of different reasons, right? Um, if there's more options, there's more mates, right? Um, if there's more options, there's also less likelihood that you're going to mate with a cousin, right? So we avoid inbreeding. Um, if there's 100 pairs of eyes, you're more likely to find a predator, right? All this kind of stuff. So uh, lots of potential benefits there. And they can be massively substantial, right? However, we often find that they're compensated for by things like increased risk of disease, um, increased uh, competition for resources, things like that. We talked before about this notion of inclusive fitness um, and the, the benefits to helping a relative or a close relative at some cost to you. The way that we're gonna define that is with Hamilton's rule. And Hamilton's rule basically says that cooperation is favored when benefits exceed costs, okay? So C here is our cost. And then our B term here is our benefit. So the R term is our level of relatedness. Okay. How much genetic material do we share? Okay. So for example, you uh, and your offspring have a 0.5 R. Your offspring share half of your genetic material. Your full brother or full sister also R of about 0.5. Your grandchildren, because they will have a quarter of your genetic material, have an R of 0.25. Your nieces and nephews have an R of 0.25. So you can see here that the closer the relation is, the higher the R. And the higher the R, the more likely you are to do something that's costly to you, but beneficial to your relative. So again here, we I, the, one of the take homes from this is that you only ever see cooperative behaviors or non-selfish behaviors in situations where relatedness is known, okay, and relatively close. If you don't know how another animal is related to you, you're not going to help them, okay? All right, so that does this for chapter 14. Uh, we will conclude uh, with chapter 15, and then we'll have an exam, and then we'll move on to the last unit of the course.